Um, and I'm going to open it up to the floor. Mikas Hadjar-Michael from the IAF has right to first question. We usually have a traveling mic. I don't think we have one, or do we? Yeah. So Mikas, could you make yourself known? And then um, catch my eye if you want to be next in the queue. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, it's indeed my pleasure to, uh, an honor to have the first uh, round of questioning. Is the, the issues covered are so broad, it's tempting to jump into all of them. But first, let me explain my biases in, in the interest of full disclosure. I used to be with the IMF for 28 years, including a reviewer for many European countries. Uh, I'm Greek, Greek from Cyprus. I'm with the IAF <laughs> covering uh, debt sovereign debt issues. I participated in the negotiations of the PSI as a member of the steering committee of creditors. And I was a member of the joint private sector, private sector committee that reviewed the experience with the debt restructuring in Europe. Uh, so I may have obvious biases, but uh, um, I, we are also covering many issues related to Pari Passu in Argentina. So I will make uh, three comments and one question, if you allow me. If you're going to make three comments, they all better be brief, though. All right. Is the debt buyback for Greece a success or not? The short answer is it wasn't necessary. It was a waste of scarce resources. Why? Uh, the only benefit is because Greece was blackmailed to do that in order to get completion of the review, and in that way it was a success. But if you are going to do a debt restructuring, for God's sake, don't pre-announce it, because you only raise the price and you minimize the benefit. And if you're going to do it, use at least new money rather than diverting existing funding that was meant to repay the banks to minimize the crowding out. So in the end, Greece is losing, and it's not getting any benefits in terms of debt restructuring or debt sustainability because the fixation with the debt ratio of 120% of GDP for 2020 is, is meaningless. The, uh, this, uh, th this perception ignores the fact that uh, the, the debt of Greece is highly concessional in the context of the, the arguments we use for developing countries. When you pay 2% interest rate and it doesn't mature uh, until after 10 years and for, for the next 30 or 40 years, it's really a waste of money. To, you don't get any benefits. Uh, what is far more important for the sustainability that is not captured easily by models bill is the fact that you cannot have any true debt sustainability unless a country restores market access. No matter what the debt ratio is, if you don't have market access, a country is destined to rely on official financing. Official financing either should be forgiven or should, it would not be unwound unless private sector chips in. For the private sector to come in, you need growth. That's a missing analysis and a missing element in the strategy in Europe. Now, uh, the second broad comment is, uh, is the uh, OMD. Uh, certainly, the um, Mario Draghi put has been effective so far on the expectation something will happen. We are hoping something will happen on the policy front, otherwise it will be found uh, wanting and we have a market backlash. The OMT actually depends on two conditions that are not easily fulfilled. First, uh, the country has to ask for a program, and second, the country has already must already be uh, having access to the market. But when it's needed, it's for countries that need to have market access, like Greece like um, um, Portugal uh, and Ireland, not when they have achieved the objective. So in that sense, it's a bit uh, narrow-minded. Now, the, um, the argument about uh, 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 the concern about growth in Greece, it misses the fact that because of constraints of political nature, Greece has been forced to, uh, to uh, implement a degree of fiscal, sustain, uh, fiscal adjustment that is unprecedented. Already the cumulative improvement in the, net prim in the primary balance is 17 percentage points of GDP. It has never happened anywhere else before. The decline in GDP is 20 percent so far and is going to 25, exceeding the decline in the US during the Great Depression. This is not a sustainable strategy. The strategy has to change. It doesn't mean the debt uh, has to be forgiven. It can be um, uh, looked at in different ways. But the emphasis on growth is missing. And Greece is having a far steeper fiscal adjustment than Ireland, and Ireland is declared a success. Now, the question. Yeah, yeah please, the question. The question. Sorry for the long-winded thing, but they are, you see they are all related. The, I would appreciate if Jeremy and others could comment on how do we get out of this mess? What should be, <laughs> what should be the strategy for Europe to have a sustainable resolution of sovereign debt crisis? Is it more growth? 
Is it more financing? Is it more direct lending by the ESM for bank um, recapitalization? Because most of these countries have high debt because of the need to recapitalize their banks. Thank you. Just before I, uh, I've got three names on my list. For, for, yeah, I've seen you, I've nodded at you. I've got three names on my list for after this. I'll ask Jeremy and, and maybe others to comment quickly. I just say, it, it is conceivable to listen to everything you just said, Mikas, and say that the answer is debt forgiveness. I mean, there's nothing in what you said that doesn't say that the answer wouldn't be just simply to write it all off. I'm not saying that is the best thing. I'm just saying that that is one possible path. Um, but let me turn over to the expert. Okay, so, so I think there are two ways uh, in which Europe can get out of the mess, uh, and they are, they are both not great, uh, unpleasant. Uh, so one is uh, restructure, uh, the other one is, is bite the bullet uh, and go for a protracted period of adjustment. I think that there are then more stupid ways of doing that adjustment that are completely self-defeating and smarter ways of doing the adjustment. The smarter ways do require a very flexible interpretation of the ECB's mandate, which I think is happening, and they probably require more efforts on the side of the creditor countries. Now, it's really not for me to say what they should do. It's a matter of political and social preferences. So my own preference is to go for the restructuring. But I can see that if you structure, I mean, let's not forget, this is a wealthy area of the world, right? If, if they want to remain at a high level, we're not talking about the lost decade in Latin America with huge amounts of poverty, right? We're talking about essentially a high living standard not continuing to grow over a long period. The downside is, of course, the huge social implications. So if Europe can find a way of mitigating the social implications of a protracted low growth period, it might well choose to go without essentially the slow pain rather than the, the fast and quick pain. Final small point, the, um, what, what, I, what I think is, is really important is that if we think of strategies for adjustment, we should not structure them in a way that takes the restructuring option off the table irreversibly. So this is what I like about um, essentially subsidy mechanisms from the north to the south that act on the flow rather than the stock, right? You gradually accumulate debt from the south or you gradually guarantee debt from the south, but all while there is still a substantial stock of non-guaranteed debt, and if this whole thing goes off track, you still have the restructuring option. What I find uncomfortable about the OMT is that it's a stock operation. It's wonderful so far because it has not been executed. It just works through expectations. The minute they actually buy the entire Italian debt, we will have lost the restructuring option. So this, this is just a side remark. Thanks. Bill, can you be very brief because we do want to get some other questions in. Right. Um, if you think the growth rates that I projected and that the, the IMF growth rates are hopelessly over-optimistic, then you might want to start reconsidering restructuring. If you don't, it seems to me that steady as you go is much better for the welfare of these economies over the longer term. There's a price to be paid if you, def if you default. Uh, you know, you can make that price a little bit lower if you just stretch out. You look at the spreads that Chile paid versus even Mexico, let alone Argentina, uh, for a decade, you know, for, for a decade. Um, Chile never enforced a haircut on anybody. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, I think very uh, seductive, but basically uh, misleading and, and misguided to, to uh, push restructuring. I don't think there's restructuring without tears. Also on buybacks, let me simply say that in 1989, Argentina could have repurchased its debt at 17 cents on the dollar and listened to economists who said, oh, you don't want to do that, they'll push the price. Well, they eventually paid 65 cents on the dollar in the Brady plan. So I think that this was a good deal on the buyback. The gentleman at the back row on the edge there, that's you, yes? Glad you come to the mic. And then there was a lady about three rows in front of him to his left. Yeah, if you could be next in line at the mic, thank you. Hi, 
Uh, John Dysart at the, with the FT. A question for first for Anna. Uh, what would problem or legal problem do you see with a, a Grise imposing those terms on the clearing and settlement systems given that all of them, Bank of New York, all the agency banks, New York Fed, all of the people that, he, uh, that were covered by the injunction, none of them were sovereign entities. Uh, meaning they are covered by New York law. Even the New York Fed is not a sovereign entity and doesn't enjoy sovereign immunity. And Argentina had even recognized that in the past by doing all of its clearing uh, for, for a very long time through the BIS, which is a sovereign entity, and which avoided that. So I don't, I don't quite understand the distinction you're making between uh, the uh, clearing and settlement systems you know, and Argentina itself. I mean, what's what's the difference? I mean, it's as if it's putting, putting the agency bank in the position of a sovereign, and you know, even the Argentines implicitly recognized that when they paid you know, an extra couple hundred basis points uh, to do all their clearing and with the, uh, through the BIS. And a question for uh, Mr. Zettelmeyer. Uh, how it, it, the, in your modeling of the effect of the buyback, it seems as though you didn't, uh, there no account was taken of the decapitalization of the Greek banking system with the, through the forced it was a forced exchange offer for them, decapitalize the banking system. A month later, they have to turn around and put the, you know, the same cash back in, having destroyed, in effect, the lending capacity of the Greek banking system and the capacity of the system for growth. All of the projections for growth that uh, Dr. Klein and you know, other people have put up are based on the availability of credit. It seems like a, that's a term that's missing in any of the modeling that was done. Uh, I didn't do my usual movie theater. Please turn off your cell phones. Please turn off your cell phones. Anna, you go first. Um, thank you for the question. So um, the argument uh, for sovereign immunity purely goes to um, what amounts to commandeering of Argentina's treasury resources, right? There is absolutely no... That has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that a U.S. court has no jurisdiction over what a sovereign government does at home, right? So we cannot know you. There's no question that a U.S. court cannot order a seizure of an amount of money or so much as a paperclip um, in Argentina or at BCRA. And what the court has done is, and what the uh, appeals court has said, was that nobody is seizing any property. We're just telling them that they cannot make this expenditure with, uh, without also making this other expenditure. And the question is whether that is consistent with foreign sovereign immunity under either FSIA or customary law, where the presumption is sovereign stuff is immune unless we specifically say it isn't. Okay? And there are some very good arguments. There's some legislative history on injunctions that makes this a somewhat fuzzy area. But that's what the U.S. brief goes to. And frankly, if the Supreme Court were to take this, which I think is a low probability, it's issues like that, not New York contract interpretation, that would drive it. Now, as for the intermediaries, there are two completely distinct arguments. One is One has to do with a really pointy-headed point of payments law, which is that intermediary banks, banks that just shuttle payments um, in the middle of the chain, are not subject to attachment or injunction. Because of the way in which this payment chain and structure is structured, um, there are some serious questions about whether Bank of New York Mellon is, in fact, an intermediary bank, um, and whether you can, uh, and the way the payment goes is it's just a credit on BCRA books, the Central Bank of Argentina to um, you know, Bank of New York, and then the money belongs to the bondholders. Right, so the question is, it's all outside the U.S., it's all in, you know, in Argentina, and can you arrest that transfer? There are compelling arguments both ways. Um, more importantly, there's case law and policies that, that suggest that financial system infrastructure, be it indentured trustees, clearing houses, you know, somebody like the DTC cannot and should not serve as enforcement mechanisms. And of course, Belgium passed a law shielding Euroclear from precisely such action. And Euroclear, which ironically is named in the judge's order, even though it's in Belgium, let alone a clearing system and immune under its own law, said, hey, we can't do it. We won't do it. This is wrong. So there's some interesting arguments there. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. 
I mean, ju just to say that I basically take your point. So, so when one thinks about the net benefits of the buyback, one has to subtract the fact that some of this may result in higher de debt recapitalization needs of the banks, which in turn increases the debt. Uh, and so I have, uh, you know, m m the, the highly preliminary number I have on the um, present value effect of the buyback, not taking into account that effect, is 8.5% of GDP. So you'll have to subtract something from that. How big that something is, I don't know. I think the effect will still be be positive, but I will, thanks for the point. I'll, I'll look at that. He's already in the spirit of taking constructive criticism well. This is very good. Joe Marie. Yeah, Joe Marie, Grease Grabber, New Rules for Global Finance, and I have to preface it briefly that I used to work for Jubilee uh, USA and debt cancellation, so um, I would like to take Anna's point of the sky is not falling, or even if it does fall, there's a phoenix phenomenon. That is this not finally the time for a comprehensive sovereign debt restructuring mechanism not located in the IMF, where sovereigns can deal with this problem comprehensively, and we don't waste decades of development or decades of lawyerly and economic economists' time can't we be comprehensive and creative finally? Okay, big think. Um, Jeremy has yeah, views on this yours. too. Um, all right. Um, so there are three distinct arguments for sovereign bankruptcy. One of them is debt overhang and collective action problems, sort of the efficiency argument, right? Um, and arguably, we have had, notwithstanding some high-profile cases, arguably, debt restructuring for the sake of efficiency has proceeded willy-nilly in a way that's not so terrible. And if this case is really um, contained on appeal, then I think the impetus for a more comprehensive system goes away. The argument I've made recently that I've belatedly come to is that the real reason for bankruptcy is to address the shortfall of, you know, fragment of uh, legitimacy in the system, which I think uh, Joe Marie was referring to, the fact that this well-oiled system is not terribly transparent um, and not um, intelligible by its, uh, you know, massive constituents and people who actually take the distribution effects, the fact that it never does give debtors a fresh start because immunity is a very imperfect. Um, uh, analog to discharge, and the fact that the system continues to be fragmented. And I think that all those arguments stay on the table no matter what happens in this case, but I certainly think that public support for a comprehensive system and policy support um, will, could go up dramatically uh, if the, the broad interpretation and the broad remedy is upheld. Bill, you've heard this argument many times. Do you want to see or something? Well, I, I don't think it's any secret that I, I think the, you know, a, a SDRM is not a particularly great idea. It's inherently, you know, gets you into the politics, who, who in the IMF decides what's fair, you know. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I just am very skeptical. I continue to think that if somebody is going to base a decision on holding out, uh, they have to look at the precedent that is established. If CREASA holds, is not overturned. The precedent is this. If a country stiff arms its creditors for a decade, totally cuts itself off, uh, then somebody's going to say they ought to get rateable payments, which means that they pay 5% uh, of the total amount they owe the people who restructured. They have to pay 5% of the total amount that they owe the guy who didn't restructure. I mean, there's enough, as German was sort of, sort of suggesting, there's enough cascades of low probability uh, hurdles in that that I do not see this as, you know, radically overturning uh, the, <coughs> the workout system that, that has developed. And I particularly think that with the CACs and, you know, you can say, okay, well, you don't have aggregation, so somebody can buy something up. Isn't that terrible? Well, that, that also, by definition, means it's not going to be huge amounts of the debt. So. I have a somewhat uh, different view about the groundswell of, of, of push for SDRM. I, I, I think it's great that we had that discussion. Um, I, I think whether a fan or not, I'm not sure there's anybody who would see a groundswell 
at the moment for the SDRM, but I'm glad to have all points of view on this. Uh, the lady right there, there's a microphone, and then we'll go this to the back. Just, just this just whole side of the room has been very quiet, so, okay, that person there. Okay, so next, sorry. Hi, uh, Nancy Jacklin, I'm at SICE. Um, just one quick follow-up on the SDRM issue is that if the problem with this case or the risk this case presents is that it makes holdouts more likely and willing to hold out because now they have a path to recovery that didn't previously exist. SDRM does not solve that problem because at least with the IMF approach to SDRM, you still had to have a majority. Some majority of the creditors agreed to a deal with a debtor and then that became binding. It was, as you said, a gigantic CAC. And, and the problem with this case is whether you're going to be able to get that majority together if creditors feel the path through the courts is going to be a better way to recover. So the only real solution to the GRISA uh, uh, approach is to keep local law as the binding law where the country can basically rewrite the debt any way they want. So I don't see that the SDRN that people are talking about is a solution to this okay. problem. Okay, thank you. We, we generally prefer questions to comments, but thank you. Um, Gentlemen, you had said you disagreed with that point? Yeah, so um, th thank you. Th I, I, I think that, um, I think we were both in the fund uh, when, when this debate took, took place. So, so um, uh, uh, roughly speaking, I do not think, I mean, there's a distinction between being the, the reason why this is so devastating is like uh, and I explained because holdouts are being given a new tool that does not consist in direct enforcement vis-a-vis -vis the country like going to Argentina and grabbing assets but rather in being interfere being able to interfere with the normal creditor relations with that country so I do not think that this will incentivize a situation where everyone has an incentive to be at the holdout unless there is a mainstream creditor there also, right? So what would happen is simply, you know, if let's take the worst possible interpretation that as long as creditors are uncoordinated, they would not have any incentive to negotiate, right? But everyone would hate that because it would mean that the crisis would continue to fester and no one would get paid, right? No one would get paid because it's not about you may now go and collect an asset in Argentina, it's you may interfere with creditor relations, but there are no normal creditor relations, right? The country is bankrupt anyway, no, no, no money is flowing. So I do think that in this uh, Grisé scenario, there continues to be a very strong incentive for creditors to get together, to coordinate, and to make a deal. Then the problem is that they will be worried about the holdout that will destroy it. And here's where the SDRM would have come in. So you would have had this process of registering claims, of appointing a representative to negotiate with the, with the debtor uh, country. And once that negotiation is successful, it would then have been binding for all holdouts. So I very much believe that the version of the SDRM that we did discuss would, would address this problem. Thank you, that was very clear and forthright. I'd like to ask the last two questions to be grouped together so we can try to come in on time. There was a gentleman in the center and back, if you could come to the mic, and then Ted Truman after him, please. If he, Ted wants to yield his time to somebody else, he can, but, uh, <laughs> but I assume he doesn't. Uh, hi, Eduardo Bornstein from IDB. Uh, I guess this is mainly from Anna. What would happen if the standard debt contract did not include a pari passu clause? And I, I mean, I'm not proposing that, I just want to know. Um, if your contract does not, oh, right, sorry. Yeah, both questions. yeah exactly, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ted. Uh, so I was gonna defer to, uh, to Nicholas Varans, but who's a colleague, so uh, uh, double up. Uh, Ted Truman from the Institute here. So my question is, and it was hinted at, and I think by maybe Bill or Jerome, answered earlier question. So is it one answer, I have a two part question, is it one issue that if this, if this holds up and in some sense it might kill off issuing debt under US law, right, but not British law, presumably, uh, but in ultimately isn't it basically saying there isn't gonna be any debt issued under anything other than national law, which some people might think is a good idea. Then I ask the second question. Uh, uh, you may call that fragmentation, but maybe it's constructive fragmentation. Uh, other question is, 
under the European or the EU or the uh, uh, co current collective action clauses. So can uh, Spain uh, change its terms still with their standardized? So when you have standardized European stuff, right, is that now European law and therefore we're in the foreign law world? Or is it Spanish law, which means that the Spanish parliament can can change it. So you are. So which which category does the European structure uh, uh, stand under? Uh, Your Excellency Esquire <laughs> and uh, the other lawyer economists practicing law without a license. Okay, I'd suggest that we do this in semi-reverse order. So Anna can deal directly with the legal hypotheticals. Jeremy can deal a bit with how Europe's going to work out, and Bill can have the last word on whether any of this is a good idea or not. Okay. Um, so on Eduardo's question, if you have no pari passu clause, you have no pari passu remedy. So that's that. Can you translate that two more so sentences for the non-lawyers? If non you have no clause that says your debt will be equal to other people's debt, you cannot then go and invoke that clause to get paid proportionately with the other people, right? So the clause that gives you the right is called the pari passu equal step clause. Um, if you don't have the clause, you don't have the remedy. It's a contractual remedy. Okay. Um, I am especially delighted to see um, Ted Truman and Nancy Jacklin, sort of Treasury and IMF officials, um, in the same place as Christina Kirchner, that domestic law is, is, is sort of the only place to go. All right, I, I, I thought I would try. Um, but, you know, the English law firms are, I think, secretly delighted at this because this could never happen in the UK. Um, I think that it's an interesting question if a, a really important court in the United States says this clause means this. I think it's terribly, well, it's not terribly, but it, it's, it's, it's harder for a court elsewhere to say, no, it means something completely different. Um, as far as Eurocacs, I am not an EU lawyer, so I think German is more of a lawyer here than I am. However, that wouldn't prevent me from talking about this. Um, the treaty commitment is to adopt these clauses in your contracts. It is not to use these clauses. It is not to you know, forbear from using other restructuring mechanisms. Now, I know that a lot of folks in Europe say that it really means something a lot more than it says, and I'm willing to trust them because I'm practicing without a license here, but I don't see it. Um, finally, if the opinion in New York said, if you're a country that stiffed its creditors for 10 years, you're cooked, I don't think anybody would have a problem with that opinion. The, the opinion is full of emotion, but its ruling says, um, there are any number of reasons why you could be cooked, and we're not really sure. All we know is that Argentina is cooked, right? So, and when the creditor's counsel was asked, well, when do you know that a debtor is a wrong debtor? He said, you know it when you see it. So, let's all go buy some rogue debt. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> German. So, so I, I'm, I'm not an EU lawyer either, or even less than, than Anna, but, but I, I think if I can just speculate, the, the, um, the flavor, I think, of the standardization is, um, well, just that, uh, standardization of analogous to the standardization of a domestic policy instrument. Uh, so my interpretation is that you know, everyone is still dis issuing under domestic law, just the, cl the contracts look the same, but parliaments can still go out there and, and change the whole thing if, if they wish. That's my understanding. And so, final world to Bill on uh, is any of this a good idea? Yeah, I, I, I just keep coming back to the fact that I think if you if you tally up the amount of debt and put it in a set of countries that are really under stress, et cetera, that this is going to be an issue for, it diminishes very quickly because it's basically stuff that doesn't have CACs in it. The new uh, standard is CACs. Uh, certainly not any of the European stuff because that's got domestic law. Um, and I continue to think because the system works on a, on a presidential process, 
any wor lawyer worth his, stall his salt is going to stand up and say, well, you know, the precedent here is, is, is you know, 10 years of stiffing uh, the, the, the creditors. So I think it's somewhat blown out of proportion, but it'll probably all be set aside because it'll probably be reversed, and uh, that may be where it comes out. On that optimistic note, um, thank you all for coming out. Thank you to Miklas and everybody with their points of view who are willing to engage in exchange on such a technical issue, but I think we covered a lot of ground. And thank you for joining us for Jeremy's maiden voyage as a public member of the Institute's team. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.